Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's April 15th. It's been a week since I got my private pilot certificates. Two weeks since we had a deep space update. And that's what I'm here to bring you. And so, yeah, we start out with the rocket launches in the last two weeks. And I am shocked because there is not a single Starlink or Long March rocket. Yes, the two leading you know, launch uh, providers, whatever, like, yeah, they're nothing. But we did start out with, uh, on the 7th of April, a Hyperbola 1 by a Chinese company called iSpace. And they were actually the first private Chinese uh, group to launch a rocket to orbit. They used a four-stage solid rocket system, basically adapted from, uh, yeah, you know, ICBMs, bought the parts from the government. Now, they were successful on their first launch, but since then they've had three other launches with payloads and none of those were successful. This one had no more payload. Again, it was another test launch and it was successful. On the 7th of April, uh, SpaceX on a Falcon 9 launched the Intelsat 40E. That's a geostationary communication satellite. But interestingly, it also carries a payload called Tempo. So this is a hosted payload that they basically decided to put on this commercial communication satellite. And its TEMPO is an acronym for Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring of Pollution, right? It's basically a space-based uh, ultraviolet spectrometer and it's designed to measure air pollution across North America. Uh, it'll provide like hourly data on levels of ozone, nitrogen dioxide, formaldehyde and other stuff in the atmosphere. 14th of April, we had the JUICE launch on Ariane 5, and of course I made a whole video about JUICE because I'm very excited for it, but it will take a decade almost to get there. Uh, yeah, so we've, we saw this launch, there was a, a well, a, a sloth turned up during the launch coverage and has become a sort of an unofficial mascot of the mission. Uh, we've seen a number of shots of the spacecraft leaving the Earth from observatories on the ground. This is going to be the last European Space Agency mission to fly on the Ariane 5. There's one more launch, but it is commercial. And then hopefully by the end of the year, they get Ariane 6 flying. On the 14th of April, there was also Transporter 7 launching from Vandenberg. So this is a rideshare mission. It carried about 50 satellites. Uh, there was like 36 total deployments from that second stage. But you know, some of those deployments were satellite carriers that carried other subsatellites. So, for example, things like D Orbit's uh, Ion, it was this one was called Masterful Mateus, and uh, Momentus Vigoride number six. There was, uh, you know, Hawkeye satellites, Lemur uh, imaging satellites for Spire, um, satellites from the US, Canada, Scotland, Italy, Turkey, Argentina, Colombia, France, United Arab Emirates. Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Taiwan, Bulgaria, Monaco, Hungary, Kenya. Some of these were for businesses, some of them for education. Uh, there was also a Sapling 2 satellite from Stanford University, which is just down the road from me. So this was a sun-synchronous orbit from Vandenberg that was aligned with midnight. That's why it launched at 12 minutes to midnight, and that was what the launch window was. I went up several times to try and get a photo and uh, kept on getting scrubbed. It, I decided to just chill and watch it from my bed, and it was a, it put on a great show. Interestingly, one one of the differences with this flight is that the nozzle extension on the second stage was shorter than normal, and this is a decision that SpaceX is making. I think it just you know reduces the cost because they uh, can cut the nozzle shorter. It's less material. It needs to be you know more tolerance for imperfections. I guess right. They can cut it short if it needs. Basically, if you use a shorter nozzle, you get less specific impulse. But if you don't need that specific impulse because your payload is light, it's not a big deal. So, yeah, this was a boost back as well. It landed at Vandenberg. There was a, you know, a sonic boom heard on the ground and at basically midnight. That was, a, I'm sure the neighbours loved that. And I got a little uh, shot from my window. A couple of hours ago, also, we had SpaceX's... Uh, Cargo Dragon at the space station undocked and is heading home. Okay, so last time I had one of these, I was uh, we were talking about the Artemis 2 crew announcement. And, uh, well, I think I did made some pretty good guesses. Uh, Reed Wiseman is going to be the commander. He is going to be joined by pilot Victor Glover. Uh, mission specialist Chris Christina Cook. Uh, I Yeah, and uh, from Canada, we get Jeremy Hansen. So, yeah... We, they'll be going on Artemis 2. They're going to fly around the moon. It'll be a free return trajectory. They're going to 
uh, you know, demonstrate, you know, maneuvering close to the ICPS upper stage. They, you know, at this point, it's supposed to happen next year. I won't be surprised if it ends up in 2025, but like it's SLS, everything gets delayed, right? But I think the main difference between this and Artemis 1 is that the Orion capsule needs a whole bunch of new systems which weren't on that. Specifically, it needs a life support system and a control panel. But yeah, they've been doing the media rounds. I saw them on the Colbert show and uh, yeah, uh, quite a few laughs there. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing this crew fly. But yes, the other big news was just yesterday. You know, we knew this was coming. We weren't quite sure when, but yes, Starship has its launch license, or Starship Super Heavy. Uh, yeah, this officially appeared, approved by the FAA late on Friday afternoon. We, yeah, we had been seeing lots of supporting evidence of this being about to happen. There were like road closures, no TAMs with temporary flight restrictions, not Mars for Mariners in the, the landing zones. But yeah, the license is now published. It's good for five years. Uh, it starts on Monday 17th at 6 a.m. local time. So get up early if you are on the West Coast. I am going to be getting up very early because I'm actually going to be getting on a plane to fly out in that direction, but I'm not going there. Um, believe it or not, there's something cooler than this that I have to go to. But yeah, I can't tell you what it is. But yeah, we'll, there's a lot of people descending on Boca Chica. If you're going to go down there, understand there's a lot of space fans going down there. This thing is probably going to be delayed multiple times. You know, don't go down there and expect it to launch on Monday morning. It's possible, but if it doesn't, you're going to need to make sure you have places to stay because you can't go and just sleep on the beach, especially since they close, close the roads. So anyway, yeah, this is a... Yeah, this they've already published... Uh, oh, sorry, the documents that the FAA published does include a few more interesting details, specifically on the environmental assessment, which they had to do to make sure that, uh, for example, the sound of Starship hitting the ocean wouldn't ha be a ma hazard to marine life. So they specify that the first stage is going to burn to an altitude of about 40 miles or uh, 64 kilometers. From there, it will perform a boost back burn back towards Boca Chica, but it is targeting a spot 31 kilometers off the coast in the Gulf of Mexico. It will perform a standard descent targeting this. It will fire its engine to slow down to just above the water, and then it will land in the water sufficiently slowly that it won't damage or it won't destroy the structure. It'll probably damage things, but it's not designed to destroy the vehicle. The, the booster will fall over just like a giant building falling over in the ocean, and that won't break it. They want to sink it, they will open all the valves, they will command all of them to open, and that will hopefully have it taking on water. If it isn't taking on enough water, they do reserve the right to make holes in it, potentially with firearms. So yes, you could go out and shoot down a spaceship if you're, uh, if you're in the right place. Now the upper stage, that is continue, gonna continue out across the Gulf of Mexico, and it's gonna thread the needle between Florida and the Caribbean islands. The engines will shut down at an altitude of 120 kilometers, and that will leave the spacecraft traveling at near orbital velocity, right? Basically showing that they could achieve orbital velocity, but they're going to be in an eccentric orbit with the perigee inside the Earth. So it guarantees that whatever happens next, it will deorbit over the Pacific. And specifically, they are targeting a location about 60 miles north of Hawaii. You might be able to see this under the right conditions, but be aware of the flight restrictions and the hazard areas. Uh, it would be very cool to see this. The um, Starship is going to perform its aerodynamic re-entry. It's going to perform the belly flop all the way down, demonstrating guidance, trying to hit its target site. And it will not perform the flip and burn maneuver. It will belly flop straight down into the ocean. And it's anticipated that that will destroy the vehicle. It will cause, uh, so there's a bunch of diagrams inside this report that model the breakup of it as it hits the ocean because they're specifically interested in how big a boom it will make and how that will couple to the ocean and how that might potentially impact sea life. And they basically had to show that it wasn't going to be a huge hazard. It wouldn't sterilize the oceans. Of course it won't. 
Uh, the Starship is then expected to sink. The ocean there is about three kilometers or over 10,000 feet deep. Also, the report mentions that they have a different hazard zone for two other launches that will come later. And this will be with upper stages, which are going to break up. They are not intended to survive. So this is presumably serial numbers 26 and 27, which don't have any thermal protection system. That will be an impressive thing to see because these things are comparable in size and mass to the Mir space station, and they're a little less remote. So you never know, maybe there'll be some film crews flying out there to capture this. Okay, so anyway, let's get back to other news. So in the last couple of weeks, we had uh, Axiom AX2. They announced that their launch is planned for May 8th. So this is an mission to the International Space Station led by Peggy Whitson. And she'll have John Schaffner as her pilot. That He is a paying passenger, but he sits in the pilot seat and will presumably be prepared to do whatever is necessary. He is actually a pilot in real life. He has something like eight and a half thousand hours in fixed wing and helicopter. He owns like a P-47 Thunderbolt, which is called the Wicked Awabit. The other two crew members are uh, Ali Alkami and uh, Renaya Barnawi, who are from uh, Saudi Arabia. They are part of the Saudi Space Commission, and they will be doing, you know, space science for that. So in the other previous uh, Deep Space update, we talked about Relativity's um, failure of their Terran 1. So, um, yeah, what we have, they now have a small update on what happened on that and a bigger update on what's going to happen next. So, yeah. They confirmed that the launch of the booster, the operation, the structural, it's all worked great. When the second stage separated, they opened the valves and fired the ignition system, but the valves didn't open as quickly as, as expected. And that meant that they were, the gas generator was starved of liquid oxygen. Another problem they had actually was that there was a gas bubble apparently upstream of the liquid oxygen pump. So, they were basically putting in more fuel, like oxygen, the gas generator didn't light. That meant that they didn't run the pumps fast enough. They weren't getting the kind of thrust they needed and it didn't ignite. And so while they did have some thrust, they were able to demonstrate the thrust vectoring and control systems work. They didn't have the oomph they needed to get into orbit. And that will be the only launch of Terran 1 because the other big announcement is they are skipping out on the rest of this and going straight to Terran R. Now, that being said, Terran R has sort of dialed back its ambitions. When it was originally announced, it was looking like a mini starship with a fully reusable first and second stage. Uh, you know, now it's more like a Falcon 9 that is going to be extensively 3D printed. It'll have a 100% reusable first stage with uh, grid fins and landing legs. It will have something like 13 engines on that first stage. It'll use electric thrust vector control for the engines and uh, electric for the grid fins as well. Uh, they're targeting 2026, I believe, for the first launch. This will, in theory, carry 23 tons to low Earth orbit in a reusable mode. Five and a half tons geostationary orbit. It's going to have a 5.4 diameter diameter payload fairing, which is bigger than anything else right now, except for Starship, obviously. That means that they are in a position that they can bid for those DOD projects. They will make sure they've got that in there. They're also backing off from 3D printing everything. They've said that having gone through one, they've now figured out what's good to 3D print and what isn't. And one thing that they're not gonna be 3D printing are those cylindrical barrel sections of the fuel tanks. They can just get sheet metal and machine it bend it and weld it and weld that to say domes that they are 3D printing and they did demonstrate 3D printing of that dome. So this is a big transition for this company. They did have a lot of funding but given that they're pushing out the launch date a couple of years, I wonder if they have enough funding to go through this and make this big gamble. Um, regardless, I mean I think that I think that relativity is in a great place because even if the rocket thing doesn't pan out, they, you know, they still have this amazing 3D printer technology. And look, if you look at this with uh, Terran 1 being essentially cancelled, Astra cancelling their Rocket 3 and scaling up to Rocket 4, Rocket Lab is still flying uh, Electron, but they're now going to be flying, they're aiming for Neutron. Virgin Orbit is dead. It's looking like small rockets are really an endangered species, right? 
So, you know, there are a few other smallish rockets. You could Firefly and ABL Space Systems. They're slightly bigger. They're like one ton. Uh, Rock rocket Factory Ellsberg, they have a 1.3 ton payload rocket. But um, also in the UK, the CEO of Orbex, Chris Larmer, he resigned. And it's really not clear whether this was voluntary. You know, did he decide or was he pushed? Orbex were also developing a small launch vehicle which was going to be powered by propane and it was going to use an interesting concentric tank design. They were, of course, planning to launch from Scotland, but, you know, they haven't really made the progress, or at least in public, they haven't visibly made the progress that one would have hoped for. So, yeah, ro small rockets, they are becoming an endangered species. And I think that they, you know, it's hard to compete with Rocket Lab and Electron who, uh, you know, they, they may not be making much money on that, but they do have a lot of other uh, hardware from their business. Anyway, uh, finally, I guess something else to look forward to other than Starship, which, you know, as I said, excitement is guaranteed. That is a SpaceX's official word. We don't know when it's guaranteed for. It's guaranteed for T0, but we don't know when that's going to happen. But yeah, um, more on a more strict, uh, more expected, more stringent, uh, I don't know, better, <laughs> a more concrete timeline. Uh, iSpace, which is not to be confused with China's iSpace, uh, Jap Japan's iSpace, they have their Hakuto R spacecraft in lunar orbit, and they are going to be landing it on the moon on April 25th. That is the time they've set. They could delay it a couple of days, but that is far more likely to happen, or I'm going to say it's more likely to happen, but that is a more likely to happen on the day that they predict. Uh, so yeah, take a look for that. Keep an eye out for it. It's going to be pretty cool. They've already published a few images from it, and uh, it'll be great to see this sort of private commercial organization landing on the moon. And with that, that's the end of Deep Space Update. Watch this space. Watch Starship. Watch uh, Hakuto R. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.